What's more, these nerve cells operate through startlingly similar pathways as the brain. In 2010, neuroscientist Diego Bojorquez of Duke University discovered that the enteroendocrine cells of the gut had foot-like protrusions that resembled the synapses that neurons used to communicate. This caused Bojorquez to wonder if these cells could talk to the brain using signals similar to the way neurons do. He hypothesized that if this were happening, they would have to be using the vagus nerve, which connects the gut and the brainstem. After further testing, they discovered that the cells do in fact use the vagus nerve to take up messages and send them to the brain faster than could be done via the bloodstream. Team effort. The connection between the brain and the gut is still being explored, but it seems that they function in very similar ways and that they function in tandem. The little brain in conjunction with the big one partly determines our mental state. When you have a gut feeling that something isn't right, or conversely, that you should follow a hunch, it's not just superstition. Your gut has its own way of interpreting events and giving your brain signals. Furthermore, when you feed your gut with subpar food, you're also feeding your brain with subpar fuel. Right now, your gut is digesting the food you just ate and sending that fuel to your brain. If you were reading this, at the same time, a part of your brain is taking in the feel of the pages under your fingertips or your e-reader, if that's your preference, sensing the comfort of the chair supporting you and monitoring the environment around you to make sure you're safe. Another part of your brain is taking in the smells of your environment, maybe coffee or a fragrance in the air, Another part of your brain is absorbing the words that I'm saying in this book and turning them into meaning, which is then processed and stored in short-term memory, where it will then be sent to long-term memory under the right conditions, which we'll get to in a moment. All of this is to say that you have the ultimate superpower between your ears. You also have the ability to hone that superpower and make it greater or to let it falter and decay. You get to decide what kind of environment your superpower lives in, one that supports your mission in life or one that distracts you from your greatest dreams. The Elusive Obvious Given that we have this tremendous power of our minds available to us, why are we struggling? If your brain is indeed so magnificent, why are overload, distraction, forgetfulness, and feelings of inadequacy affecting us so much? How do we reconcile the fact that we have so much potential, but have days where we can't remember a simple name or think our way out of a paper bag? The answer is so simple. It's almost the elusive obvious. We were not taught how. Give a person an idea and you enrich their day. Teach a person how to learn and they can enrich their entire life. School is a great place to learn. There we're taught what to learn, what to think, and what to remember. But there are few, if any, classes on how to learn how to think, and how to remember. In his seminal book on education, Creative Schools, Sir Ken Robinson says, one of my deepest concerns is that while education systems around the world are being reformed, many of these reforms are being driven by political and commercial interests that misunderstand how real people learn and how great schools actually work. As a result, they are damaging the prospects of countless young people. Sooner or later, for better or for worse, they will affect you or someone you know. My guess is that they have already affected you and everyone close to you. As you already know, my experience with the education system was a complicated one. 
and I acknowledged that my circumstances were unusual. In reality, though, even if I never had that fateful head trauma in kindergarten, I would probably have gotten much less out of my school education than was ideal. That's because very few schools anywhere in the world have incorporated learning how to learn into their curriculums. They'll fill us with information. They'll expose us to great works of literature and to figures who change the course of history. They will test us, sometimes endlessly, to determine whether we can repeat back what they've taught us. But they won't get underneath all of this to teach us how to teach ourselves, to make enriching our mind, discovering new concepts, and truly absorbing what we learn fundamental to our everyday lives. This is not about placing blame on the teachers who work hard to teach our children. In my opinion, teachers are some of the most caring, compassionate, and capable human beings in our society. In fact, my mother became a teacher after my brain injury because I was struggling so much and she wanted to help me and others like me. The problem lies in the outdated system in which teachers work. If Rip Van Winkle woke up from decades of slumber, the only thing he would recognize today are our classrooms because they have evolved so little. Education hasn't changed enough to prepare us for the world we live in today. In an era of autonomously driven electric cars and vehicles capable of taking us to Mars, our education system is the equivalent of a horse and carriage. R is for review. One of the best ways to reduce the effects of the forgetting curve is to actively recall what you learned with spaced repetition. You are better able to retain information by reviewing it in multiple spread out sessions. Going over the material at intervals increases our brain's ability to remember it. To leverage this principle, before you begin your listening or reading session, take a moment, if only a few minutes, to actively retrieve what you learned the session before. Your brain will give greater value to the reviewed material and prime your mind for what's to come. Quick start. Before each reading, Take a few minutes to talk about or write what you remember from the previous reading. Choose wisely. The French philosopher Jean Paul Sartre noted that life is C between B and D, meaning that the life we live is the choices we make between the B, birth, and the D, death. The profound simplicity of that statement is particularly relevant to the journey we're engaged with here. Being limitless is a choice, and that choice is entirely yours, regardless of your circumstances. You can choose to give up this power, but why would you when you know that you can truly live a life without barriers. But choosing is an active thing, and the time to make this choice is right now. So, I want you to resolve and commit. Most people are sincerely interested in doing something that they know they should do, but they still don't do it because they consider it a preference, not a promise. There's tremendous power in making a real resolution. I want you to write down your commitment to complete this book. When we write something down, we're more likely to do what we promise. So right now, if you haven't already, go to limitlessbook.com forward slash resources and download and print your commitment page. If you want extra points, take a photo of your signed promise and post it on social media. This will be your public resolution to help you stay accountable. Tag me at Jim Quick, K-W-I-K, 
hashtag limitless book so we could cheer you on. Here's your commitment. Repeat after me. I, your name, commit to reading this book in 10 to 25 minute increments until it is finished. I commit to focusing by forgetting my prior understanding, distractions and limiting beliefs of what is possible. I commit to being active in the process. I will do all the quick start exercises. Take notes, highlight, and practice. Asking myself relevant questions as I read. I commit to manage my state of being as I read. Checking in regularly with my energy levels and being proactive in adjusting my motivation as needed. I commit to teaching what I learn to others so we may all benefit. I commit to entering my reading time in my calendar because if it's in my schedule I will do it. I commit to review what I've already learned so I can remember it better before moving on to something new. And finally, I commit that even if I mess up with any of the above, I won't beat myself up. I'll get back at it and do my best. Yes, I am ready to be limitless. The questions are the answer. Have you ever read a page in a book, arrived at the end, and could not recall what you just read? You may even reread it, only to forget it again. I don't want you to experience this while you are reading this book. So why do you think it happens? The answer is, you're not asking the right questions. Questions, in fact, are the answer. Every second, your senses gather up to 11 million bits of information from the world around you. Obviously, if you try to interpret and decipher all of them at once, you'd be immediately overwhelmed. That's why the brain is primarily a deletion device. It's designed to keep information out. The conscious mind typically processes only about 50 bits per second. What makes it through the filter is determined by the part of the brain called the reticular activating system, or RAS for short. The RAS is responsible for a number of functions, including sleep and behavior modification. It also acts as the gatekeeper of information through a process called habituation, which allows the brain to ignore meaningless and repetitive stimuli and remain sensitive to other inputs. One of the ways to guide the RAS are the questions we ask ourselves. These tell that part of our brain what is important to us. Let's take my younger sister's birthday as an example. Years ago, my sister kept sending me postcards, pictures, and emails of pug dogs. You know the ones with the mushy faces and the bulgy eyes? They're very docile. You can dress them up as ballerinas and they won't care. Of course, I wondered why she was sending me photos of pugs. And then I remembered her birthday was coming up and it was evident she was leaving clues because she wanted one. 
Later that day, I was checking out at the health food store, and I looked over at the other checkout line. To my surprise, I saw a woman carrying her pug over her shoulder. Wow, I haven't seen one of those in a long time. What are the chances of that? I thought. The next day, I went running in my neighborhood, and there was someone walking six pug dogs. The question is, where did the pugs come from? Did they just magically appear? Of course not. They were always there. But in the flood of stimuli, I had never paid attention to them before. Once pugs broke through my awareness, I started seeing them all over the place. Have you had an experience like this? Maybe it was a specific kind of car or outfit that magically began appearing everywhere. In an interview with media personality Jeannie Mai, we compared this effect to how your favorite social media platform starts showing you more posts based on past expressed interest. The site you're on knows this because of what you clicked, liked, or watched before. Your RAS is like that site's algorithm. It shows you more of what you express interest in, and it hides the things you don't engage in. F is for forget. The key to laser focus is to remove or forget that which distracts you. There are three things you want to forget, at least temporarily. The first is what you already know. When learning something new, we tend to assume we understand more than we do about that subject. What we think we know about the topic can stand in the way of our ability to absorb new information. One of the reasons children learn rapidly is because they are empty vessels. They know they don't know, but some people who claim to have 20 years of experience. Have one year of experience that they've repeated 20 times to learn beyond your present sense of restraints. I want you to temporarily suspend what you already know or think you know about the topic and approach it with what Zen philosophy calls a beginner's mind. Remember, your mind is like a parachute; it only works when it's open. The second thing is to forget what's not urgent or important. Contrary to popular belief, your brain doesn't multitask. More on this later. If you are not fully present, it will be difficult for you to learn when your focus is split. Quick start. As you are listening and reading this book, when your mind inevitably wanders into something else. And that something else is important, but not urgent. Don't try not to think about it. What you resist persists. Instead, keep a notebook close by to capture that thought or idea by writing it down. You can thus release it temporarily to be addressed after the task at hand is complete. And finally, forget about your limitations. These are the preconceived notions you believe about yourself, such as that your memory isn't good or that you're a slow learner. Suspend at least temporarily what you believe is possible. I know this may sound difficult, but keep an open mind to what you can do. After all, since you are reading this book. Some part of you, deep down, must believe there's more to life than what you've already demonstrated. Do your best to keep your self-talk positive. Remember this: if you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. Your capabilities aren't fixed, and it's possible to learn anything. A is for act. Traditional education has trained many people that learning is a passive experience. You sit quietly in class, you don't talk to your neighbor, and you consume the information. But learning is not a spectator sport. 
the human brain doesn't learn as much by consumption as it does by creation. Knowing that, I want you to ask yourself how you can become more active in your learning. Take notes. Do all the quick start exercises. Download the Quick Brain app to test and train your limitless abilities. Go to the resource page, limitlessbook.com forward slash resources for additional free tools. If you're also reading the book in print, as many of you are, I recommend that you highlight the key ideas, but don't become one of those highlight junkies who make every page glow in the dark. If you make everything important, then nothing becomes important. The more active you are, the better, faster, and more you will learn. Quick start. What is one thing you will do to make listening to this audiobook a more active experience? Write it down in your notepad now. S is for state. All learning is state dependent. Your state is a current snapshot of your emotions. It is highly influenced by your thoughts, your psychology, and the physical condition of your body, your physiology, your feelings or lack thereof about a subject in a specific situation affect the learning process and ultimately the results. In fact, when you tie a feeling to information, the information becomes more memorable. To prove this, I'm guessing there's a song, a fragrance, a food that can take you back to your childhood. Information times emotion helps create long-term memories. The opposite is also true. What was the predominant emotional state you felt back in school? When I ask audiences this question, most people in the room shout out, boredom. In all likelihood, you could relate to this. If your emotional energy at school was low, it's no wonder you forgot the periodic table. But when you take control of your state of mind and body, you can shift your experience of learning from boredom to excitement, curiosity, and even fun. To achieve this, you might try shifting the way your body moves in a learning environment or peaking different moods before you sit down to learn. Change your posture or the depth of your breathing. Sit or stand the way you would if you were totally energized and excited for what was coming. Get excited about how you will benefit from what you're about to learn and what you will do with your new knowledge. Remember, all learning is state dependent. Consciously choose states of joy, fascination, and curiosity. Quick start. How motivated, energized, and focused are you at this moment? Rate your current state on a scale of 1 to 10. What is one thing you can do right now to increase that number? T is for teach. If you want to cut your learning curve dramatically, learn with the intention of teaching the information to someone else. Think about it. If you know you have to give a presentation on what you learn, you will approach how you learn the topic with the intention of mastering it well enough to explain it to someone else. You will pay closer attention. Your notes might be more detailed. You might even ask better questions. When you teach something, you get to learn it twice, once on your own and then again through educating another person. Learning isn't always solo. It can be social. You may enjoy this book more if you invite someone else to learn with you. Buy a copy for a friend, or even better, start a limitless book 
club that meets weekly so you can discuss the ideas and concepts in this book. You'll enjoy learning more when you're making memories with a friend or group of friends. Working with someone else will not only help you stay accountable, but it will give you someone to practice this method with. Quick start. Find a learning buddy to read this book with and hold each other accountable. Name that person or persons in your notepad. E is for enter. What is the simplest and most powerful personal performance tool? Your calendar. We enter important things on our schedule. Work meetings, parent-teacher gatherings, dentist appointments, taking Fluffy to the vet, and so on. Do you know what a lot of people don't schedule? Their personal growth and development. If it's not on your calendar, there's a good chance it's not getting done. It's too easy for the day to slip by with you forgetting to work out your body and brain. Quick start. Take out your calendar and enter your limitless readings for the next seven days. Label these Limitless Me, Genius Time, Brain Training, Conversations with Jim, or anything else provocative enough to guarantee you'll keep this date on your calendar. So often the answers we want are there, but we're not asking the right questions to shine a spotlight on them. Instead, we're asking useless questions or worse, questions that are disempowering. Why am I not smart enough? Why am I not good enough? Why can't I lose weight? Why can't I find the person I'm meant to be with? We ask such negative questions and then those questions give us evidence or pugs as answers. The human mind is always generalizing in order to make sense of the world. Here, there, everywhere, we can find evidence to confirm our beliefs. Thinking is a process of reasoning through something, during which we ask and answer questions. You may be asking, is that true? See, you had to ask a question. While we have tens of thousands of thoughts a day, we have one, maybe two, dominant questions we ask more than others. As you can imagine, these questions direct our focus which directs how we feel and how we consequently spend our lives. As a thought experiment, imagine someone whose most frequent question is, how do I get people to like me? You don't know their age, career, or what they look like, but you know more than you probably realize. What do you imagine their personality is like? You don't need to know much to guess that they are a people pleaser. They're indirect in expressing their needs, and they're not authentic about how they feel or think in any given moment. Someone who is constantly asking themselves how to get people to like them can never truly be their true self because they will always be molding themselves to the preferences of the people around them, even if they're not aware of it. You know all this information about them and you only know one question they ask themselves. What do you think is your dominant question? Your dominant question. When I felt my brain was broken, I loved to escape into the world of superheroes, comic books, Dungeons and Dragons. The world of fantasy helped me forget my pain. I decided that the superpower that would be best for me was invisibility. And my dominant question became, how do I stay invisible? Instead of being seen, I was always watching everyone else, wondering what everyone else's life was like. I wondered why this person was so popular and that person was so happy or what made another person so smart. I was suffering all the time, so as I watched people and learned from the world around me, 
my dominant question changed to, how do I make this better? I wanted to solve this riddle. How does my mind work so I could work my mind? The more and more I asked these new questions, the more answers I got. This book is the result of two decades of asking empowering questions. I first met Will Smith at Quincy Jones's 80th birthday party. After hearing about my traumatic brain injury, he invited me to be his guest at the premiere of the film Concussion, a movie about the concerns of football-related head trauma. On that note, I'll talk about brain protection in an upcoming chapter. Eventually, Will booked me to come to Toronto to spend time with him for a week on set. He was shooting a superhero film, so you can imagine that I was in my glory. What was interesting was the cast and crew were working each night from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. outside in the dead of winter. Not all Hollywood is glitz and glam. There's a lot of hurry up just to wait on set. During a break, Will and I discovered a few of his dominant questions, one of which is, how do I make this moment even more magical? While we were waiting for Will's next scene to shoot, his family and friends were huddled in tents, watching the other actors work. At 3 a.m., while I'm sure everyone was cold and tired, we got to see his dominant question in action. He was bringing everyone hot cocoa, cracking jokes to make us smile, and actively playing host when he could have been resting. He was indeed making the moment even more magical. The result of this question directed his focus and his behavior and completely changed the experience for everyone. Quick start. What is one dominant question you ask yourself? Write it down in your notepad. Prepare your mind. Questions direct your focus, so they play into everything in life, even listening and reading comprehension because people typically don't ask enough questions when they read, they compromise their focus, understanding, and retention. If you prep your mind with the right kinds of questions before you read, you'll see answers, pug dogs, everywhere. For that reason, I place specific key questions throughout the book. To start you off, here are the three dominant questions to ask on our journey together. They will help you to take action on what you learn and turn the knowledge into power. Question number one, how can I use this? Question number two, why must I use this? Question number three, when will I use this? How can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? Quick start. These are your three magic questions. I want you to remember them, write them down. How can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? They will help you to integrate the knowledge from this book into your head, heart, and hands. Ingrain them. Write these questions down where you can see them, anywhere from your desk to your phone. Instead of passively reading, consider these questions as you take in the knowledge in this book. Remember, questions are the answer. At the beginning of every chapter for the rest of the book, you will find a series of questions that are designed to prime your focus as you read. Study the questions before you read each chapter, and you'll be better prepared to understand and remember what you learn. Along with the questions, 
do the quick start exercises seated in strategic places throughout the book. They are specific activities designed to train yourself to take immediate action in your learning and life. Most of these can be done in one or two minutes. Remember the power of neuroplasticity. Every time you answer a question and do a new activity, you rewire your brain. I also conclude each chapter with exercises to do before you move on to the next section to really set these lessons into practice. So we, we, have, we have amazing, amazing gifts built inside of us. So the brain, the gut, the heart, they, they all have these ways of communicating with each other and, and it's, it's a bigger system than just independent pieces of our body that's amazing. Which is why, you know, our forward was written by Dr. Mark Hyman and when we're talking about functional medicine, we don't treat any one area. We're not talking about just, just brain when it comes to learning, left brain, right brain. We're talking about not just whole brain, but whole self learning. It's, it's, your, it's your left brain, your right brain, your three brains, it's your conscious, your unconscious, your unconscious genius. It's your gut, it's your, it's your heart. There's so many things that are involved here. And as complex as it is, it's, it's more complex than, than the stars in the known universe. And that's what's so exciting. Every single year, we discover more about our capabilities. And what we're finding is we're grossly underestimating our own potential. And we've discovered so much. And this is, these are very exciting times for sure. Well, that's something that surprised me a lot about this chapter was, you know, we talk about human potential. We talk about our potential. And, and I think I've always seen you know, potential as being like, oh, there's like a little bit more room to go. But this chapter like opens it up to really how how radically transformative our, our our own internal processes could be like there's the brain and what it could do and so i just want to ask you i think so many of us didn't grow up in this model we grew up in the model of oh an old dog can't learn new tricks you know that's just the brain i've got really limiting beliefs about our own capacity if you could give everyone who's listening to this book right now the most empowering possible belief about their brain mm. what would it be you know, I'm glad you brought that up because in part two, when we talk about limitless mindset, we are actually going to uncover and decode the seven lies that we tell ourselves about our potential, about our brain. But not only that, I'm going to give you a three step formula to take a disempowering belief like genius is born as opposed to being made or that we use only 10% of our brain or some of these disempowering beliefs and we're going to turn them into empowering beliefs because all behavior is belief driven. So if you had to give us a little preview now, one, one belief to hold as we go forward and start learning from your book, what would it be? I think the meta belief here is that there are no limits that our intelligence is not fixed like our shoe size, that regardless of your age, your background, your career, your education level, your financial situation, your gender, your personal history, your IQ, your potential is not set. And that's the most exciting thing. When we're talking about neuroplasticity, your brain is the ultimate adaptation machine. And it responds just like your muscles do to stimulus. When you work it out, it gets stronger. And your brain is the same way. So you absolutely can teach a dog new tricks. That's so exciting. And I know in this book, you're going to teach us a lot of, you know, like what we're going to learn. But of course, so important, like you were teaching us before, how we learn. That's so exciting. And now I'm really excited because, of course, you are teaching us so much of what to learn, too but really importantly, teaching us how to learn. So let's get to that now. Chapter four, how to read and remember this and any book. Your time is one of your greatest assets. It's the one thing you can't get back. As your brain coach, I want you to get the greatest results and return on your attention. 
So here are some recommendations on how to get the most out of this book. You can apply this advice towards practically anything you want to learn and read. Let's start with a question. Have you ever read something only to forget it the next day? You are not alone. Psychologists refer to this as the forgetting curve. It is the mathematical formula that describes the rate at which information is forgotten after it is initially learned. Research suggests humans forget approximately 50% of what they learn within an hour and an average of 70% within 24 hours. Here are a handful of recommendations that will help you stay ahead of the curve. Later, I will share advanced strategies to accelerate your learning and retention in the sections on study, speed reading, and memory improvement. Research suggests that our natural ability to concentrate wanes between 10 to 40 minutes. If we spend any longer on a given task, we get diminishing returns on our investment of time because our attention starts to wander. For that reason, I suggest you use the Pomodoro Technique, a productivity method developed by Francesco Cirillo based on the idea that the optimal time for a task is about 25 minutes, followed by a five-minute break. Each 25-minute chunk is called a Pomodoro. As you read or listen to this book, I suggest that you read for one Pomodoro and then take a five-minute brain break before continuing. When it comes to learning, the Pomodoro technique works for reasons related to memory, specifically the effect of primacy and recency. The effect of primacy is that you're more likely to remember what you learn in the beginning of a learning session, a class, a presentation, or even a social interaction. If you go to a party, you might meet 30 strangers. You're most likely to remember the first few people you meet, unless you've been trained to remember names with my method, which I'll teach you later in this book. The effect of recency is that you're also likely to remember the last thing you learned, more recent. At the same party, this means that you'll remember the names of the last few people you met. We've all procrastinated before a test, and then, the night before the exam, sat down to cram as much as possible without any breaks. Primacy and recency are just two of the many reasons cram sessions don't work. But by taking breaks, you create more beginnings and endings, and you retain far more of what you're learning. If you sit down to read a book over the course of two hours without taking any breaks, you might remember the first 20 minutes of what you read. Then maybe you'll experience a dip around the 30 minute mark and then you're likely to remember the end of what you read. This means the lull in between with no breaks for assimilation or thinking through what you just read results in a dead space for learning. So take this book one Pomodoro at a time so you can get the most out of what you listen to and what you read. If you still choose to cram, you'll learn helpful methods in this book to retain the in-between information. Did you know that the very act of reading this book will make you smarter? I realize that's a big claim, but I'm completely convinced that it's true. On one level, it's going to teach you to be smarter through the tools and tactics I share here. But on another level, when you actively listen and read it, you'll form pictures in your mind and you'll make connections between what you know and what you're learning. You will think about how this applies to your current life and you will imagine how you can use the knowledge you're taking in. It promotes neuroplasticity. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, 
Every now and then, a man's mind is stretched by a new idea or sensation and never shrinks back to its former dimensions. When you read any book, you have the opportunity to stretch the range of your mind and it will never be the same. Quick start. Set a timer for 25 minutes right now and concentrate on what you're reading in this book for that amount of time. When your alarm goes off, bookmark this book or pause the audio. Then write down what you learn within that 25 minute period. Use the faster method. To get the most out of this book, here is a simple method for learning anything quickly. I call it the faster method, and I want you to use this as you listen and read starting now. The acronym FASTER stands for FORGET, ACT, STATE, TEACH, ENTER, REVIEW. Here's the breakdown. And then there's the matter of how we're earning our livings is changing profoundly and increasingly rapidly. Automation and artificial intelligence, AI, are affecting the future of work. And I'm not speaking only about factories where laborers are being replaced by robots. In addition, many of us are facing the need to switch from the structure of an office job to the volatility of the gig economy. The jobs that few of us might have imagined even five years ago have gained traction, while others are emerging this very moment that will affect the workplace in coming years. All of this points us in the same direction. We must take charge of our own learning. If schools tell us what to learn, but not how to learn, then we need to do the rest of the work ourselves. If digital overload threatens to hijack our brains, then we need to use what we know about learning to reset the ground rules. If the workplace is evolving with so much rapidity that we can never be sure of what work will mean to us tomorrow, then only by taking complete control of our learning can we truly be prepared for an unknowable future. Turn on the power. A quick, often told story. One day at a power plant, everything comes to an abrupt halt. All the machines go offline. The silence is deafening. The people running the plant are frantic, and after hours and hours, none of the workers can track down the problem. The head of operations is desperate at this point, so he calls the best local help he can find. The expert technician arrives and glances around the facility. He goes to one of the numerous beams, all with electrical boxes, opens one of them, and stares at the various screws and wires inside. He turns one screw, and like magic, everything starts working again and the plant comes back to life. The head of operations is so relieved. He thanks the technician and asks him what he owes him. The technician says, $10,000. The head of operations is shocked. $10,000? You were here just for a few minutes. You turned one single screw. Anyone could have done that. I need an itemized bill, please. The technician reaches into his pocket, pulls out a notepad, scribbles a few seconds, and hands the other man the bill. The head of operations reads it and immediately pays him. The bill read, turning screw, one dollar. Knowing which screw to turn, nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. The lesson of the story, it's not that you have a screw loose. The story illustrates two things. The first is how much added value a limitless mind can offer you and others. We've entered an expert economy in which brain power trumps brute strength, where what you have between your ears is the greatest wealth creating asset. There's those who know and those who don't know. And that applied knowledge is not just power, it's profit. Your ability to think 
solve problem, make the right decisions, create, innovate, and imagine is how we add value. The faster you can learn, the faster you can earn. And that takes us to the second lesson. That one screw made all the difference. I've mentored and coached some amazing minds, and you don't have to be a genius to see genius leaves clues. One of those patterns is that elite mental performers filter and focus for those handful of screws that make all the difference and turn everything else on. This book is filled with many of the behaviors, tools, and strategies I've discovered to give you the maximum results and rewards for your effort. The world is throwing more challenges at you than ever before, and there's every indication that those challenges will continue to increase. At the same time, there is more to be gained from having a finely tuned brain than ever before. And you know now that you have more than enough potential to meet any challenge, but it's going to require taking control of your learning. It may seem as if it would take superhuman capabilities to keep up with the demands of our current reality, but you already have a hidden superpower, your brain. You may not be able to shoot webs from your hands, but you have something far better, the neural webs in your head. That superpower plant of a network between your ears is your greatest gift and greatest advantage. All we have to do is upgrade your brain the same way you upgrade your phone. How do you install new software into your brain? One of my favorite ways is what you're doing now. It's called reading. What a wonderful window into this incredible brain that we have. That's, that's amazing. And so surprising about the second brain, the gut. Right. And so you've talked about the brain and the gut. And, you know, I've often heard you sometimes mention like the heart. We so do. what role does the heart play in all this? So it's interesting because the heart also has neurons. And so we actually, I always tell people that if they want to improve their self-esteem overnight, just study your body. Your body is this, is this incredible genius and this is incredible superpower. Your brain and your heart, they work together to produce emotions, right? Your, your heart actually contains neurons similar to those in your brain and your heart and your brain are very closely connected and they have this uh, symbiotic relationship because your heart and your brain are so connected, your brain's autonomic nervous system signals your heart to pump its oxygen-rich blood. And your heart responds by delivering blood to your entire body, including your brain. Your brain is only about 2% of your body mass, but it requires 20% of its nutrients. When we're talking about the gut, that's why we do a whole section in this book on the best foods for your brain, you know, and what you nourish flourishes. And so thinking about your brain, like the roots, you're giving it the best foods ever. So it could be absorbed to go up to, uh, go up to your brain. And so research, we've discovered more in the past 10 years than the previous thousand years. The heart is an information processing center. It can, it can learn. It can remember when people say they have heartache. You know, when we're talking about emotions, I always tell people that information by itself is forgettable, but information combined with emotion becomes more of a long-term memory. The areas of our brains like the amygdala, the thalamus, the hypothalamus. So as your heart is processing different stimuli, it actually acts independently of our cranial brain and actually also connects and sends signals to the key areas of our brain, such as the hypothalamus, such as the amygdala, which, which helps to regulate our perceptions and our emotions. Part two, limitless mindset, the what? Mindset, noun, the deeply held beliefs, attitudes, and assumptions we create about 
who we are, how the world works, what we are capable of and deserve, and what is possible. The first element of the three-part limitless model is mindset, which is the mental attitude or disposition that predetermines a person's responses to and interpretations of situations. Mindset is made up of beliefs, assumptions, and attitudes we hold about ourselves and the world around us. All behavior is driven by belief. So before we address how to learn, we must first address the underlying beliefs we hold about what is possible. We're not born with pre-installed mindsets about what we're capable of achieving. We learn these fixed and limited ways of thinking from the people in our lives and the culture we experience growing up. Think of a young elephant tied to a stake in the ground. When it's a baby, the elephant isn't strong enough to pull the stake up, so it eventually stops trying because it learns the effort is futile. As the elephant grows, it gains more than enough power and strength to pull out the stake, but it remains tied up by something as inconsequential as a rope and a flimsy piece of metal because of what it learned as a baby. In psychology, it's called learned helplessness. Most of us behave like that elephant. At some point, we had an experience that gave us an impression of what we're capable of and our belief about our potential has been set ever since. But just as helplessness is learned, it's just as possible to learn to be limitless. In this section, you're going to learn about the seven lies we've been taught about our potential and how to replace them with new beliefs. I use the term lie intentionally. In this case, lie is an acronym for limited idea entertained. If you are like the vast majority of people out there, you are entertaining ideas about yourself that define you as something less than what you truly have the potential to achieve. You're giving these ideas energy and allowing them to take residence in your mind, but they're really nothing but BS. In this case, an abbreviation for belief systems. Over the coming chapters, you will discover where these lies come from, how they imprison you, and what you can do about it. And keep asking yourself this question, how many of my perceived constraints are nothing more than lies and BS? I think you're going to be stunned with the answers and that these answers are going to be liberating. A quick story before we get going. One of the most cherished friendships of my life was the one I shared with Stan Lee. As you know, Stan's Marvel creations helped me through some of the biggest challenges of my life when I was younger. And they continue to be a nonstop source of inspiration to this day. My conversations with Stan were always engaging and very often illuminating. I remember one such conversation when we were in a car together on our way to a dinner. Stan looked resplendent in his suit with a bold Spider-Man tie, and I was inspired to ask him something I've always wanted to ask. Stan, you've created so many great characters over the years, like Avengers and X-Men. I said, who's your favorite character? He didn't even hesitate a second. Iron Man, he said. And who's yours? I pointed to his tie. That would be Spider-Man. Stan nodded and said, With great power comes great responsibility. That's so true, Stan. And the opposite is also true. With great responsibility comes great power. He seemed to like that, which tickled me to no end. 
but while I've never phrased it in that way before, I realized that I was voicing one of the key tenets of the limitless mindset. When we take responsibility for something, we are imbued with great power to make things better. That's what a limitless mindset is all about. Our background and circumstances may have influenced who we are, but we must be accountable for who we become. It's about understanding that we are responsible for our assumptions and attitudes. And when you accept that all of your potential is entirely within your control, then the power of that potential grows dramatically. So, superhero, let's get started on unlimiting your mindset. And as Stan would say, Excelsior! Thank you.